Be sure to go to FlipSideGaming.com and use promo code 6 for 10% off on orders over $10. Do the same with the Grizzly Gentleman, 10% off at checkout on your fantastic beard products. Or you could shop via the TCG Player affiliate link in the description down below to help support the show. And last, but of course not least, you can go to Grey Viking Games with the uh, affiliate link below to pillage some sweet arena codes. What is up, Planeswalkers? Theric 6, back with some more Magic the Gathering. Um, thank you. Uh, I want to I wanna start off by saying thanks to everyone who has uh, uh, stuck by me while I uh, take essentially a break um, to work on my grad school stuff. Um, the daily videos will come back eventually, probably the end of the semester. Um, I, I have this video, uh, then I have um, the cards that I'm most uh, excited to play with uh, in Historic. Um, from Strixhaven, and then I'll probably do another video on um, some decks for Strixhaven that include not just the Strixhaven cards, but, you know, a bunch of things. Um, you might notice I have glasses. Apparently my eyesight is not great, so I recently bought glasses. Anyway, today we're going to be talking briefly-ish about the cards for... There we go. Everything's, everything's fine. We're going to be talking briefly about the cards from Strixhaven, not the Mystical Archive cards, just the Strixhaven cards themselves, um, that could be decent in Death and Taxes. Now, I do want to say that I think that because of the introduction of a lot of kind of degenerate card, storm cards, essentially, into Historic through the Mystical Archive, I think that we're pretty likely to see uh, Death and Taxes have some sort of power. Death and Taxes really does like to prey on unfair decks, and technically speaking, uh, storm decks, not exactly the most fair. So, I'll start off here with a lesson. Now, before I get into this actual card, I have some lessons on here to talk about. I don't have any card with learn on here, because all of the learn cards are bad. They're not, like, even remotely good. So, when I talk about the lessons, they're going to be as cards themselves. They're, they're not going to be as lessons. You, you essentially don't want to use these as lessons because, frankly, none of the learned cards are worth diluting your main deck for. So, Academic Probation, love the name. Two mana sorcery, lesson, choose one. Choose a non-land card name. Opponents can't cast spells with the chosen name until your next turn. Uh, or a chosen uh, choose target non-land permanent until your next turn. It can't attack. Blah, blah, blah. You either get to uh, just completely hold something down for uh, a turn cycle, or you make it so your opponent can't do a specific thing for a turn cycle. Now, later on, we're going to talk a little bit about some other cards in the black-white uh, version of Death and Taxes, which really does help uh, when you know what's in your opponent's hand. Obviously, if you're playing in uh, best of three, you don't have to know exactly what's in your opponent's hand for this to be decent. If, for example, your opponent has been playing a lot of setup cards and they have, you know, maybe one piece of a three card combo in play you can just say all right this turn i'm gonna go ahead and not lose i'm gonna, I'm gonna say no you can't you can't grape shot me uh, on your following turn the unfortunate bit obviously is the fact that this is sorcery so you have to know that it's coming <laughs> which is not great for you um because obviously your opponent th that gives you one extra turn but if you don't have a follow-up or you can't kill your opponent on the the subsequent turn you're still probably just gonna lose um, I like the idea of this card, and if enough um, kind of all-in combo decks uh, do arise, I think there might be some room for this in specifically the non-black, hilariously, um, and the non-blue versions. The reason for this is because black has access to this card, and the blue versions have access to um, uh, the, the Meddling Mage. And Meddling Mage essentially is this, but better. So uh, if you're playing mono white or the white red or white green version, I could see playing this um, to help out in those very specific circumstances. Elite Spellbinder, it's PV... It's very hard. PVDDR's uh, card. Three mana, free one, flyer. When it enters the battlefield, you uh, look at target opponent's hand. You may exile a non-line card from it for as long as that card remains exiled. Its owners may play it. A spell cast this way costs two more to cast. So I wish this card was a little better. Uh, first things first, obviously... It's a three mana card. We have a ton of those, but at least it has flying, right? At the very least, it's free power with flying. That's something that can kill a lot of things. People. Uh, but also, it can die to a lot of things. Sure, that's fine. Death and Tax is well known for not having the, the uh, toughest of creatures. But the fact that it only affects the one card and it doesn't affect cards with that same name is pretty unfortunate. Yes, it's pseudo discard, 
staple to attacks, which for what it's worth, I, I, I respect that design space. I think that's actually a very interesting uh, design space. It's very similar feeling to um, to uh, the, the flying uh, Freebooter, something Freebooter. Uh, it's very similar to that card, except with this, I believe, uh, for as long as I Yeah, so with this card, you can get rid of the Spellbinder and your opponent still has to pay that extra two. But the fact of the matter is, right, they can just cast a different version of that card and they, in like, I don't know, I just wish it was cards with the same name. Uh, that said, wait, Spellman, I, I have my doubts that this card is going to see play because of the fact that it only hits the single card. We already have access to, um, not Dalk Mira, but the actual creature version um, that allows us to kind of delay these board wipes or, or these very um, high high CMC spells. So I just feel like this card is not going to be able to cut it in a situation where we have so many uh, three drops that are great. Reduced to Memory is an interesting card. It's a lesson. Don't care. Don't play it as a lesson. Three mana. Exile target non non permanent. It controller uh, creates a 3 2 red and white spirit creature token. This card is just better than Divine Gambit in almost every way. So let's let's really quickly look at Divine Gambit, shall we? Two mana sorcery. Only hits artifact creature enchantment. This hits any non non permanent. Divine Gambit only hits something an opponent controls. This hits something you control. This is sorcery, the other one's a sorcery, this costs one more, sure. If controller makes a 3-2, this is this is a known quantity, or known entity. You know exactly what your opponent is gonna get out of this, right? This card can be anything. <laughs> it could even be something that isn't listed here. This card is trash. This card has potential. The fact that it is three mana, makes this card not the best. This card is still leagues better than Divine Gambit. Would I have preferred for this to be a two-mana card? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would have. It would have been much better as two-mana card. Or three-mana instance. I think that's reasonable. Um, th the reason they didn't have this be an instant, though, is because you could do tricks on your own cards. You can still hit your own things if, for whatever reason, you want to. Um, but th this card is actually just super strong. Being able to exile an Ulamog, um, any any of the uh, uh, any Planeswalker, turn them into a three-two, and you might be saying like, you know, your creatures aren't all that large. We still do have a, a few creatures with first strike, and the fact that this only has two toughness instead of three can be very helpful. We have some creatures already that are able to tap things down. Uh, just generally speaking, this body is so much less of an issue than this is. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this card is going to see play for sure. Um, in the main deck or the sideboard. I'm just saying that this card actually has a potential and this does not. Semester's End, very interesting card. Um, similar in many ways to, um, gosh, what's the, I don't remember the name of the angel <laughs> from Kaldheim because she did uh, turn out to be very good. But Semester's End instance, uh, four mana exile any number of target creatures in our planes workers you control, beginning of the next end step. Uh, return each of them to the battlefield under its owner's control. Each of them enters the battlefield with an additional one counter on it if it's a creature and a loyalty if it's a planeswalker. This card saves your creatures from board wipes and makes them bigger. You don't have to target all of your creatures, but you can. You can target only a couple. You can target as many as you want. These are things that you control, which for what it's worth, for effect like this, I think is fair. Um... It does cost four mana. It's not a creature. It's interesting. I I don't think it's going to see a ton of play. I think that um, you're better off playing uh, creatures that allow you to give your um, your creatures indestructibility or protection or what have you. Uh, but what I like about um, these these cards, and I, I kind of talk about this whole, uh, a little bit too much, is the fact that there's uh, too many cards that are good at three CMC. What what I should say is that. The fact that we have all of these cards means that if the meta shifts slightly in such a way where, you know, you don't want a creature to do this, like you don't want an onboard trick, and you're going to be playing something that uh, you're going to be holding up mana anyway, then Semester's End gets better. Like, for example, if um, if Gavany Township 
um, enters um, enters historic. And you're playing with more angels for whatever reason. That makes the call time angel a lot worse and this a lot better because it allows you to hold up mana without wasting it because of Gavney Township. But also you can actually exile your own things because the angel can't exile angels. So this for right now is not gonna see play in historic um, death and taxes, but it could in the future. Sparring Regimen is very interesting. This is like the only learn card that I thought could maybe see play. The problem is it's three mana. Obviously, you know, three mana enters the battlefield learn. Essentially, this could read like three mana tutor a specific card, right? We've, we've seen a couple lessons already. One, two, literally a couple. I think there are a couple more. So, you know, this could be literally three mana tutor a thing and have a little bit more upside. The fact that you can attack and put a, cre a, a counter on one of your creatures is very nice. So theoretically, you could make Thalia quite a bit bigger. But you can't curve Thalia into this because Thalia makes this more expensive because this is not a creature. Now, if this were a creature, if it was like a three mana 2-2 two, two creature that had literally this, it would be awesome. But it's not. Even if this was like on another target attacking creature so it couldn't make itself bigger, like this card would be sweet. But it isn't. So it's not. Um, if this was two mana, it'd probably be too strong, I suppose. Uh, but then you could just like get rid of the um, untap it, so then you like don't have the pseudo vigilance. This card is so close to being like actually decent for um, for uh, a death and taxes style deck, maybe. No, I, you can't even really justify playing this in a white weenie, right? Like everything else in a traditional aggressive white weenie deck, um, because everything else on three is just better, right? Like banalish commander or whatever the hell his name is the the triple white pip card um even uh the queen triple white pip card um hell even something like glorious anthem or something like all of those would be better than this because it affects all your creatures this only affects one right so i really wish this was either a creature or cost one less and didn't have this it's close but no cigar strict proctor this is like the card right this i think was even pleasant kenobi's reveal card right two mana one three Flying. The fact that it has flying is great, right? This has Takadli Honor Guard stats with the Hushbringer's ability. Notably, right, this is any permanent, okay? This is not just creatures. This is not just creatures and artifacts. This is any permanent. It doesn't affect dice triggers either. So if you're playing a deck that is Death and Taxes-y that has dice triggers, this helps. If you're playing against a deck that has dice triggers, this unfortunately doesn't help, but there are other cards that can deal with that. But the fact that this has three toughness means that it can block things decently. And the fact that it's flying means that you can get in for some damage here and there. The biggest issue I see with this card in Historic Death and Texas right now is that for right now, Croxa is still a strong card. Croxa is still played in some top decks. So until Croxa either becomes less played um, or it gets banned... I'm not super comfortable playing this. Additionally, it does affect your own things, including your other your other permanents, but frankly, we're playing mostly creatures. But what's really awesome about this card is that it can just shut down things. Uh, it can just shut down like a bunch of decks, right? It just annoys the crap out of a bunch of people while still allowing your opponent to potentially get value out of it. So I really like, I really like this card uh, as an arsenal. I like the fact that it's two mana instead of being like three mana, two, three flyer because we just have way too many of those. Um, but if you're going to... If, if Croxa, not super played soon, um, and there's still, like, Neoform combo, other forms of combo that require permanence entering the battlefield, for example, uh, then I think this card has some great, um, great potential. Especially considering, like, right now, we don't have the best two drops um, in Mono White Death and Taxes, at least. So this, this helps out. But... Then we get to the blue cards. Notice I haven't had a lot of white cards there. I was looking at Strixhaven's full set list, and it felt kind of thin. I'm not sure why. I think one of the big reasons, one of the big issues, is that a lot of the cool power is going to come from the Mystical Archive, and um, Strixhaven as a normal set has been kind of overshadowed by Eldraine. So hopefully, hopefully, it's still we still see some interesting stuff in Historic, but who knows. Tess of Talents is a really interesting card, though. Um, it's The reason I have it here is because I'm a sucker for 
uh, necromancer style effects, unward ego style effects. And this essentially does that, but only for instance of sorceries. This is an instance, not a creature. So if you're playing blue, you're playing meddling mage anyway. So you probably don't need something like this, but if your opponent is playing a specific, um, uh, a specific uh, d -d -d combo deck that involves not storm, because this doesn't actually work for storm, and does involve instant sorceries. Like, say they're playing, um, let's say that they're playing ultimatum ramp or something, like where their whole goal is to ramp into ultimatum and that's like all they kind of do. This helps, but at the same time, just play meddling mage, right? Um, if this did exile cards on the stack with the same name, obviously it'd be much better. Cause it's just like, hey Storm, you know that, you know that uh, mechanic that we're putting into historic? We have, a, we have an answer for you, you're fine. But it doesn't, so I just wanted to talk about it because I think it's interesting. Callous Blood Mage, very interesting. 3 minus 2, 1. Kind of have a lot of 3, uh, three CMT things, but 3 MV thing, things. Uh, you get to choose one of these three things. The fact that it has Exile Target Player's Graveyard is like why it's on here. Um, with Death and Taxes cards, I do try to have things that either are very taxing or... Um, not super taxing, but still have a nice amount of versatility. And I think this card has a sufficient amount of versatility. N mainly, you're going to be using this, if you play this in the uh, Orzhov version, to draw a card, right? This essentially is like, three man, I'm going to draw a card, lose a life, whatever. With sometimes being able to get some other things. Mainly, exiling someone else's graveyard. Being able to just have a creature that is good in other scenarios, and that can allow you to get rid of um, someone's graveyard is going to be fantastic. If you're going against control, you get to do this. If you're going against aggro, you get to do this, where you have two blockers for the price of one and you get to gain one life. Like this is, this feels like an understated card in terms of the fact that it's a three mana two one, but it can do a lot of good things. Note though, uh, that it uh, is a bit of a number with this. <laughs> Conspiracy Theorist, I love this card. Two mana two two uh, in red. We have a few, like, two drops. We, Red has a lot of interesting cards for Death and Taxes, in my opinion, uh, in Historic right now. And Conspiracy Theorist adds to that. Having a, a card where, you know, you, you attack with it, you get to uh, pay one, discard a card, draw a card. Cool stuff, right? We get to get rid of our excess lands, dig a little deeper. You do have to attack with it, which is a little unfortunate, but, you know, whatever. But what's cool is that when you discard a card, you can exile it. You discard one more. Yeah, you exile one of them, sorry. Because uh, theoretically, you can get your whole hand discarded by your opponent. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, if you do, you may cast it this turn. So that's just cool. That's just generally cool. Um, obviously, if you're going against a, um, a discard deck and you have this on the field, they're probably not going to force a discard on you. That is, like, of something that you could cast, right? There are a few things with Flash. There are a couple of instants that you might be playing in Death and Taxes. Um, but... You know, this is an onboard trick. Your, your discard opponent probably not going to actually help you out here. But the fact that you can still, like, if you have if you have excess mana, not only can you get rid of extra lands that you're discarding, but if you have excess mana, but really need a specific card, but um, you only, like, have, like, you're in top deck mode. Like, you're in top deck mode, you really need a removal spell. You drew a creature. It's not a removal spell. It's not going to get you there. You have to attack. You, you get this, you, you, you discard a card, you don't get there, you can still, like, you, you're not losing that resource, right? That's that's the, the thing I'm trying to get at here. You're not losing that resource. You're still going to be able to utilize it if the card that you draw isn't as good as the card that you got rid of. And I really like that about this card. It's a little unfortunate that it, um, that it has to attack and it's statted like this. I would have loved to see this be a 1-3, actually. Like, this being a 1-3 or even a 0-4 would make this so much more interesting. Um of a card because then it's like oh, I could leave it back to block or I can attack with it and now I get to shoot like it's less likely to die but I'm not going to get damaged through so I know it's cool but meh closing statement very weird card three mana instant um, destroy target creature planeswalker you don't control uh, put a 1-1 counter up to one target creature you control cost two less to cast during your end step uh, the main reason I have this here uh, is because of the fact that it can uh, put a 1-1 counter on a creature you control and in a deck like death and taxes where we, we want to have removal but still make it so our opponent is going to die, uh, this card could theoretically be helpful. Uh, it really only sets up a different card that does an effect like this, but better. Uh, in black-white, we just don't need this effect. Fracture. This is interesting. Two mana, instant destroy an artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker. 
this is not a main deck card, but it is a very interesting piece of potential removal for the sideboard in black, white, death, and taxes decks. It's very, it's efficient. You know, it's only two mana. And it's versatile because it can hit an artifact and channel a planeswalker. And you don't bring this in. Like, this isn't a Mortify style card, right? You're still going to be playing your normal pieces of uh, creature based removal in your, uh, in your Orzhov deck. But what this does is, if you're going against an artifact deck, or an enchantment deck, or a planeswalker deck, a deck that has a large number of any one of those types, or I guess somehow a bunch of these, um, then you can bring this in and do well. I really like this card. Humiliate. I fucking love this card. This essentially is Thought Erasure, but for creature decks. Target opponent reveals their, uh, their hand. You choose an online card from it. That player discards that card. This, this is just good old-fashioned discard. Put a one counter on a creature you control. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, obviously, uh, we don't have a ton of one-drops. Typically, it's going to be Aelcid or uh, uh, Sack Dog. <laughs> I don't remember Sock Dog's name, but there are other uh, one drops that that you can play theoretically. The um, the knight, the, the one mana one two vampire knight. Uh, so there are other uh, options. But what's really awesome about this is even if you don't have a creature, this is still just like decent discard for the uh, the black white version. Uh, if you do have a creature, it just makes the card a lot better. Right? Especially if you're able to put it on something like flying, if you're able to put it on a creature that has lifelink or first strike, something like that, it can be very helpful. So I really, uh, really love this card. And not only does it help death and taxes, but it really helps like black, white humans, which I'm actually kind of afraid of. Like I think black, white humans are getting a lot of valuable stuff, including this card. Killian Ink Duelist. Two mana. Human Warlock. Lifelink, Menace, spells you cast that target, uh, that target a creature costs two less to cast. Two, two. His Lifelink and Menace uh, feels very similar to the dog, uh, Cuneros, the Hellhound dude. Um, the spells you cast the target, a creature costs two less. So essentially this means that, uh, theoretically you can play a lot more removal, and it costs less. I don't know if this is really going to be Death and Taxes card. I think that, uh, we have better things to do at two mana. But I do want to point out the fact that you could maybe, maybe see some sort of like a stranger version of death and taxes that includes um, some buff spells that are a little bit more situational uh, that get better because of killing. I'm not sure that's possible. I just wanted to, I think I'm referencing all of the cards that could be decent. Rip apart. Really cool. A sorcery, which is unfortunate, but three damage to a creature, a planeswalker, or destroy target artifact or enchantment. This is uh, similar to a braid, uh, except that this can hit uh, enchantments. I think a braid is an instant. This isn't, uh, but this can also hit planeswalkers, right? So essentially, you're taking the the red part of the braid, hitting creatures, uh, artifacts, and adding some white for planeswalker or enchantment. Uh, I just like the versatility of this card. Seems like a decent sideboard option um, for the Boros Death and Taxes. Back to white black because I don't know how to do things apparently. Shadrix is the only dragon that I think is even remotely reasonable. And even then, I don't think it's the best. Typically, I don't love the five mana cards in Death and Taxes, but uh, I did want to mention this card because I try my best to mention all of the cards that have some potential. It's a two five with flying and double strike. Decent stats already. And then you have to choose two if you want to choose any of these abilities on combat. Someone can make a 2-1, someone can draw a card and lose one, and someone can put a 1-1 counter on each creature to control. Now, notably, you get to make these choices, so you get to choose when to use it and who gets what, obviously. If you're playing against a control opponent and you have a bunch of cards in hand and you just want to add to your clock, make it so your opponent can get a counter on the creatures that they probably don't have, and you get another creature. If you're playing against a uh, an aggressive deck that has a lot of creatures on board. Honestly, you probably just don't use this card. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, you maybe make your own squad bigger while giving them a creature, but you probably don't want to give them a creature. I mean, essentially, like, this card... When I first read this card, I was like, oh, I mean, you know, it, it seems interesting, but, you know, I, I don't really want to share all the things. Because when I first read this, I was like, okay, you get to... Your opponent gets one. No, no, you, you choose one. 
or you choose two. Your opponent gets one, you get one. It, it's too it's too even, except against uh, control that doesn't have a lot of creatures out. Uh, so generally speaking, I don't love this card. <laughs> There's a long way for me to say I don't love this card. Silver Coil Command, uh, I also don't love. This is this is kind of the thing that I was talking about with Killian. Like theoretically, um, I could see a world where you play Silver Quill Command in uh, a Black White Death and Taxes because of essentially these two things that you can choose in conjunction with like these, right? But if you have Killian, right, this essentially costs two as long as you as long as you target this, right? Uh, spells you cast that target a creature costs two less to cast. So as long as as long as this is one of the choices, this can cost two, which is actually like not and that's not terrible, right? You're getting plus three, plus three in flying. And one of these, right? Against control, you get this. Against aggro, you get this. Um, against anything, you just have a very good card, you can get this, right? Um, there, there's a lot of value here, uh, especially if you have Killian. I don't know if this card alone is good enough and if Killian alone is good enough. Because even if you're playing them in the same deck, you're not always going to see them together. So I don't know if seeing them apart, they'll be... The, the badness of them will outweigh or be outweighed by the goodness of them together. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> but I do I do like the idea of this card. Silver Quill Silencer is very similar to a white-blue version of this card. Uh, it's very similar to Meddling Mage. You choose a non-land non card name. Whenever an opponent casts a spell with a chosen name, they lose three and you draw a card. It's opponent, so you can't essentially use this to lose your lose life yourself just to draw cards. So you can't like turn to Silver Quill Silencer, name uh, a three drop that you have, cast that three drop, right? You you can't uh, play this, then name um, Skyclave Apparition, cast Skyclave, lose three life and draw a card. You can't do that. It does have three power, which means it's more uh, deathy uh, against the decks where you kind of want this, which is against control. And even though it allows your control opponent or your combo opponent uh, to play the card, you get to the fact that you draw a card and they lose three. It's not like they lose two, right? The difference between two and three can be huge, especially considering the fact that this has three top, uh, three power, right? So I'm super curious to see if this card is going to be able to to kind of be good enough. And I want to see a like I'm, I'm gonna make a deck that's like Azorius that essentially just punishes my opponent for doing anything, like for casting things, like it hurts him. So we're gonna play Meddling Mage, we're gonna play this. Uh, we essentially Meddling Mage the, the board wipes, we Silver Quill the cards that we allow them to play. And we just get rid of them anyway. Uh, love this card, absolutely love it. it. Seems really cool. Vanishing Verse, Exile Target, Monocolored Permanent. It doesn't hit Colorless Permanence, which I'm a little sad about. Obviously we'd have to say like Colorless and Non-Land Permanence if they wanted to do that. Like. I think the coolest version of this card would be like Exile Target, Monocolored, or um, Colorless, Non-Artifact, Non-Land Permanent. Because you know, then it just hits a wider array of things. Um, but if you're in a situation where you're, there's a lot of like strong Monocolored cards around, I think this is still reasonable. Um, obviously, there are like there are still cards that are played that are Monocolored, even in multicolored decks. Um, things such as... Um, I mean, this gets rid of Cat, gets rid of Sack Woman, the, the DJ. Um, this is decent against mono green decks, mono red decks, obviously. Um, you know, it, it has play against a lot of things. It's just, who knows if the overlap is going to be good. Who knows if the density is going to be good enough for this to be decent enough. This card seems sick, though. Venerable Warsinger, 3 mana, 3-3, three, three, Spear, uh, Cleric. Vigilance Trample. Always love Vigilance uh, in my uh, Death and Taxes list because it allows me to attack and defend at the same time. Whenever this deals combat damage to a player, you may return target creature card with mana value extra less from your graveyard to the battlefield where actually the amount of damage this is dealt to that player. This seems awesome. Picture for a second you have Ailsid. You sack Ailsid, give Venerable Warsinger protection from the only color that uh, is shared among creatures your opponent's control. You attack them, you deal three, uh, you get this Ailsid back. Awesome. Or. You just attack, you get a Thalia back, you block with your Thalia, you attack again, you get your Thalia back, cool things, wow. You, you, this card is just so sweet. You can also get other versions of itself back. Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may return target creature. It deals combat damage to a player. Uh, Typically, you're not gonna be able to get itself back. I'm certain there are very niche situations where you could. What, I'm, what I mean by you can get other versions of itself back is literally, you have one of these in your graveyard, you attack, you hit your opponent for three, 
you get that three that three thing back. The fact that it puts it to your battlefield is just so awesome. Like this card just seems sick. I, I'm super stoked to play with this card. It just it just feels so good. Um, I don't know. Obviously, we have the one drops, but I wonder how many other like sacrifice style cards that we'll have access to. I know we have the um, the flying creature that exiles graveyards. But what I would really want to see, what I really want to see, uh, Remorseful Cleric is the card I'm thinking of, uh, is the Selfless, it's, I know Selfless Savior, is it Selfless Spirit? Yeah, what I really want to see is Selfless Spirit, uh, because that would just be sick with this card. Flame Scroll Celebrant, now we get to a few of the modal DFC cards. 2 minute 2 1, whenever an opponent activates an ability that isn't a mana ability, deal 1 damage to that player. Uh, this is very similar to Harsh Mentor, which we've seen um, Harsh Mentor not do a ton of things in Historic Death and Taxes, uh, but it's just generally, you know, it's a, it's a fine card that allows you to have big fire breathing. I've already said I really like versatility in my Death and Taxes cards. Uh, this card, on, it, on just the first face we're looking at, has a nice Death and Taxes effect, has a mana sink. Seems decent. But also, you can have this card as an upkeep effect against combo decks where your opponents can no longer cast spells or activate abilities of uh, uh, loyalty abilities. Sure, you have to exile this, but typically in a red white death taxes deck, you're not going to be getting, you're not going to be recasting this card. Sure, technically there is one scenario. That's unfortunate for the exile. Essentially, you cast this. If it didn't exile, um, you could then get the front face back with this card. But that's fine. I think this card is going to be super strong in the Boros Death and Taxes deck. Because if it's not a spell-based combo deck, you get to just hurt your opponent. And if it is, you should be like, nah. Love it. Absolutely love this card. Fantastic. Mila, Crafty Companion. 3 mana, 2-3. More Death and Taxes, I'm just loving it. Like, I feel like Wizards really added a lot of uh, interesting cards for Death and Taxes. Whether or not it'll be good enough remains to be seen. Whenever an opponent attacks one or more Planeswalkers you control, put a loyalty... Don't care. Frankly, don't care. We're, we're, we're not really playing Planeswalkers. Whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. Cool. This doesn't help, obviously, with... Um, with board wipes but we have some cards against board wipes technically we already have some cards against uh single target removal we have um not valkymira we have some i can't think of any of them but for what it's worth right we have things like bone crusher giant so now they would have to take two damage and we would get to draw a card but if we're just the fact that we get to just harass the crap out of our opponent means that our job is just going to be easier, right? Death and Taxes just needs to draw a card. It needs to keep applying pressure. And when your opponent is punished for answering the pressure you're applying, it makes it more likely that you're going to win. The fact that this is a permanent that you control is also huge. We've seen a lot of the Azorius uh, control decks run four Field of Ruins. Even if uh, we don't have a ton of great uh, non-basic lands right now, we might. And if we have Mila and they want to blow up one of our non-basics, they have to think twice because then we're going to draw a card. Um, if for some reason we have a Planeswalker and they just tried to blow it up, we get to get a card, right? All of these all of these things like blend really nicely together. Thalia into Mila against an opponent who really needs Thalia off the board means that not only is their entire turn going to be spent killing Thalia because of her tax, but we also don't lose a card. We lose board position but we don't lose a card, and that's incredibly valuable to maintain the pressure that we have. Especially if we can then go into something like this card and get Thalia back. <laughs> right, so I just love this. And that's before even looking at the back half. As I've said, I love versatility. If you are in a situation where you're playing Boros Death and Taxes, and you just get to the late game, you can, you can play this. <laughs> you may discard a card if you do, draw a card. If a creature card was discarded this way, draw two cards instead. Late game. Maybe you don't need this Ailsid, right? Maybe you just need something the hell else. Discard the Ailsid, draw two cards. Cool. Minus two, return to our creature cards from your graveyard to the battlefield against haste, exile to the beginning of the next end step. Or next upkeep. It's probably not going to be all that great. Um, 
it is nice that it sticks around for an entire turn cycle. Like, it's not the beginning of your next end step, it's the beginning of your next upkeep. Which does mean that, like, you can get a tax effect for that turn. But if you're playing Luka, Luka, whatever, and you're playing this card, then you're also going to be able to get access to that good old-fashioned Super Fire Breeding. Which can be very helpful. And then minus seven, you get an emblem with whenever creature enters the battle from your control, it deals damage equal to the power to any target. I mean, that's pretty sick. If you could just plus one, plus one, um, then for the rest of the game, all of your Garbo creatures have, have essentially reach. It, that's sick. It reach, not the mechanic, but reach. The, you all know what I'm saying. <laughs> Selfless Glyph Weaver is a three mana, two, three. Exile it. Creatures you control gain instructable until end of turn. I wish this didn't say exile, but I understand why it does. Um... Yeah, I mean, this is this is just a uh, beefed-up version of the um, Southless Savior. Again, it sucks. It sucks that this exiles. But if it said sack, I could see a world in which this probably gets a little bit too good. But still, like, this is this is just, hey, um, my opponent is playing board wipes. Nah. It's cool. Just, just nah. And, of course, if for some reason... You're in a situation where you really have to use this, you can. Essentially, you're never going to use this. This is almost always just this card. But the fact of the matter is, like, this is here. Like, you can use it. But I'm not really going to talk about it because uh, it doesn't matter. And then last for this uh, episode, whatever, is uh, Shale, Dean of Radiance. Two mana, one, one, Flying Vigilance. Tap, put a one, one counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. Um, this is very similar to my case, the Lunark. Uh, the difference here is that this card has Vigilance and Flying. It means that you can attack with this card and still get extra value, right? Being able to um, attack for one damage, whatever. You play your three drop, you tap this and make your three drop better, right? Like, it, it, and you're not even like losing a blocker per se because that the one one of toughness is just going to that other creature. Um, and once you get to the late game where you're able to play, you know, two two drops in a turn or a one and a two drop or something like that, then this card's ability just becomes a little bit better. So I really do like this card. And you can flip it over. Well, no. Nah, you know what I'm saying. And you can have a four mana four four, which is just decent, right? Like, this just allows you to have, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, just a beefier creature in a deck that doesn't necessarily have the beefiest of creatures. And, but when we count on another target creature, then it deals two damage to that creature. Since a lot of our creatures have three toughness to begin with, um, Ambrose is not typically going to kill them. While we can kill a bunch of X1s from our uh, aggressive opponent's uh, decks, Whenever a creature you control with a one counter on it dies, draw a card. Also, it just makes it great. The fact that this isn't sorcery speed, so you can go ahead and um, put a counter on a creature that's maybe targeted for death, um, and then draw out of it is is another way to, to draw some cards uh, in in a deck that uh, goes against like control or something. So I really like this. Uh, really like the set in general for a lot of the the cool like fun cards. Um, for example, freaking Semester's End. Love the name of that. Um, no, not Tessa Fountains. There's, there's one card that that I just love the name of. Which one was it? Because I, I didn't actually do a full... Uh, Expel is nice, but I think it was a blue card. Maybe I didn't do an actual... Multiple Choice. I love the name of Multiple Choice. Pop Quiz. Like, all these... It's just, it's just really fun uh, to have, like, this kind of school-based thing. And I think they did a decent job. Um, I just think that it's unfortunately been overshadowed by a bunch of uh, other sets. So yeah, uh, this this is the Death in Texas video. I will be putting out a video on probably like my top 10 or so cards that I'm super excited to play with from uh, Strixhaven. Uh, some, I'm going to not use Death in Texas decks for that just because of the fact that... Or Death in Texas cards for that because I have just went over the Death in Texas cards. Um, I'm trying to think if I can show you any previews of a card that I'm super excited to play with. Oh, there's one around here. I thought there was a... Pondrix card. Yep, I don't know. Regardless, hope you've enjoyed my uh, new my new shades. Um, as always, I have a uh, PO box for you to send me things. Uh, I'll open them on camera unless you prefer me not to. I have received uh, something that uh, I wasn't requested not to open on camera, but it was just better that I didn't. Uh, anyway, I'd like to thank my lovely patrons, especially Fogwin and Balatair. If you'd like to join them, support the show. Um, even though I'm not, uh, you know making content a ton right now uh you know economic uh, economic times uh, hit hard and if you have disposal disposable income i would uh, definitely appreciate it um yeah i'll be i'll be back with some more videos soonish until next time i'll be one <laughs>